Hello, sir. It's a pleasure to be speaking with you. Um, like Pyle said, sir, um, we are in a very particular, in a very peculiar, in a very difficult time in the um, journey of this country. And uh, as somebody who's been inside the ring or otherwise had a ringside view of uh, many such times in the past of this country, I'm sure the people who have tuned in are very keen to listen to your thoughts and your views on how we can steer ourselves out of the difficult position that we are in. However, speaking about the present without the context of the past is um, not entirely um, always a complete experience. So I'm going to start very quickly with two odd questions um, about the immediate past and then come on to where we are at this point in time. And the first question that I want to talk to you about is the sort of high growth years. And this is something you write about beautifully um, in your book, but the high growth years of the UPA, which are slowly becoming the sort of unicorn that came in onto our horizons and then, um, you know, fleeted away. Um, there is, you debunk this myth in your book that those high growth years were simply achieved because of favorable global conditions. I was hoping that you could quickly take us through as quickly as possible um, some of the decisions, the governance, the, the sort of fiscal and monetary decisions that made it possible for the UPA to be able to take advantage of favorable conditions to engineer that sort of growth? Well, um, good question. Um, you know, let me say that um, whenever economic performance is evaluated, particularly in a contemporary uh, political context, I mean, whoever's in the government says that everything good that's happening is because of us, and whoever's not in the government says nothing to do with you, it was either done earlier or because of the world. And that's a good, it's a healthy thing. So let me give you my take. Number one, there's no question that the high growth that we achieved during the UPA years, particularly in the first seven of those years, uh, when you know the growth rate averaged about 8.3%, according to the national accounts data, which existed at the time. Uh, and then it slowed down. But remember, even after the slowing down, the 10-year average was about 7.6%, which had never, ever happened before and isn't happening since. So in terms of the period being a high growth period, there should be no doubt about that. Now the question is, to what extent uh, is this due to something the UPA did? Well, let me say right at the beginning that there's no doubt in my mind that the high growth was achieved as a result of the cumulative effect of the economic reforms that were begun in 1991. Now, those reforms were actually introduced by the Narasim Rao government with Dr. Manmohan Singh as the finance minister. Uh, and they were a major break from the past. I mean, efforts had been made before 1991 to slightly improve the situation, but they were not, they were just incremental. This was a real break. And the government made it plain that they're doing things differently. Of course, you know, it wasn't done all of a sudden. I mean, that's the consequence of uh, democratic constraints, uh, the push to gradualism. So while the reforms were major in conception, uh, they took some time to actually unroll, and some of them actually didn't even get done. So because of that, uh, the benefits of the reforms did not appear immediately. I mean, the 1990s were in some sense better than the 1980s in the post-reform period. Uh, but then you ran into the East Asian crisis in 1997. So you really didn't get the full sense of what the economy could do until the year in the 2000s. Now, I want to emphasize also that one of the very, very important things about that period was that when the Narasimha Rao government was voted out and the United Front came in, I mean, the United Front actually had the Communist Party as members. Uh, it was a left-oriented government. But they managed to convey a sense of continuity that, look, uh, we may have our political differences and we may throw political barbs at each other, uh, but we are actually doing, we know what's good for the economy and we're doing more or less the same thing. 
Even more important, when a Vajpayee government came in, in 1998 or so, uh, they they were actually from the other end of the spectrum, which uh, very often was regarded as uh, not favoring opening the economy, not favoring uh, uh, sort of um, a, a strong kind of uh, push to bring in foreign investment and so on. But I think the Vajpayee government managed to convey the sense of continuity with change. So some tweaking here and there, Anyone looking at the Indian economy, businessmen and investors, would have said that, look, these guys are essentially moving down the same path. Each one is saying, I'm going to do better. But you're not saying we're doing radically different things. And you're not rubbishing what was done before. And therefore, there was a very long period when policy seemed to be moving in the same direction. Now, of course, you know, there were political, uh, there were political posturing. I mean, for example, uh, uh, on the NDA side, uh, it was sometimes said that the high growth of the UPA years really started in the last year of the Vajpayee government. Because, you know, in, in 19, uh, uh, I think in the year 2003, 2004, uh, the growth rate was quite high, 8%. But actually, that was because it followed a depressed year, because the agricultural output in the previous year had suffered. If you took an average of what the Vajpayee government achieved, it was much less. That's a minor detail. Uh, then others said, well, yeah, it's high growth it's because of global boom. It was a global boom period. There's no doubt about that. But, you know, the global boom uh, was raised growth rates more or less everywhere. But the increase in India's growth rates was much more. So in the book, I explained the fact that certainly the global positive global developments uh, were an important reason why we do, did well. But we did much better than could just be explained by global developments. And I think that was the reflection of the cumulative change in policy. Now, you would, you would ask the question, well, did the UPA do anything? I mean, you know, was it just kind of past policies and you just wait and uh, uh, see the boom unfold? I think they did quite a bit. I mean, one thing is that, you know, um, Many people were very critical of the UPA uh, because they felt that since the UPA had won the election, uh, criticizing the BJP for the Shining India slogan, that somehow they would veer to the left and not be in favor of growth and all the rest. That's not what the UPA did. They made it very plain that they wanted a high growth rate, but they also put in, put in this point that it, it has to be an inclusive growth process. And let me say, uh, I think that's absolutely essential. I mean, if you don't, in a, in a democratic environment, if growth isn't going to translate into benefits for everybody, it's simply not going to be sustainable. So now the question is, what exactly did the UPA do? I would say that uh, two or three very important things. One, there was a radical reduction in the fiscal deficit during the UPA years, uh, from the start of the UPA years to just before the financial crisis, the big reduction in the fiscal debts. Why did that happen? Well, revenue certainly boomed because growth was high, but we didn't waste those revenues by unnecessarily expanding expenditure. We did expand expenditure in some of the areas where it needed expanding, but at the same time, we took advantage uh, during those high growth years to actually release a lot of resources that went into private investment. So I think that was a conscious macroeconomic strategy. Second, uh, the government gave a very clear signal that, look, we want more private investment and we want more foreign investment. And very clear signals were given that we want to expand uh, the range of foreign investment. Second, on some of the important domestic reforms, particularly tax reforms, uh, I mean, the UPA said, look, we want to go for a GST. And they said we will move a constitutional amendment. Now, they weren't able to do that. But that's, again, politics. You know, and as a matter of fact, it was the BJP governments that opposed the G, uh, GST. But, you know, when the NDA came in later, they were the first ones to go for it. Nothing wrong with that. I mean, that's politics. But uh, the point is the signal that people got is that, look, this is a reform-oriented government. If you want to invest in India, it's going to be investor-friendly. 
uh, and therefore people were reassured. Now, the fact that Dr. Manmohan Singh was the prime minister and the fact that Chidambaram was the finance minister and he had established a, a bit of a reputation uh, even earlier uh, during the United Front government for continuing the reform process and lowering taxes, income taxes, etc., I think reassured people that this is going to be a business investor friendly environment which raised confidence. Of course, the global boom also helped. There's no doubt about that. So I would say that it was a, a combination, a fortunate combination of circumstances in which the central government did play a very important role. It's not as if they did nothing uh, and saw, saw growth take place. You know, the other legacy, um, Dr. Aluwalia, of, of uh, the UPA years, even though the first thing that comes to mind, of course, is high growth because, you know, we seem to be so obsessed with it, perhaps because it's been eluding us. But uh, the other big legacy is poverty reduction. And you write about how that was achieved on the three pillars of a robust, creating a robust welfare state, agricultural reforms, and of course, high growth. Could you now, I mean, you, your chapter is wonderful. I mean, the, the bits that you write about it are wonderful and all those who want to read about it really should. But could you just give us a, a taste of the interplay between these factors that led to that sort of dramatic reduction of poverty? Well, that's a, that's a very good question, actually, because, you know, in the book, I try to emphasize that uh, amongst the activists who are very keen on inclusiveness and a bit suspicious of growth, uh, the tendency was to think that, you know, uh, poverty goes down because you have programs directed at the poor. Whereas my perception, I think the government's perception was that there were three big components. Component number one is simply the high growth itself. I mean, let's face it, unless the high growth is of a very distorted kind, you know, you, you can, for example, have a high growth which is led entirely by mining, uh, highly capital intensive, very few people involved, growth goes up, but nobody benefits. Generally speaking, if you have a high growth strategy, there's going to be more employment, people are going to benefit, the so-called traditional trickle-down effect. Now, you know, Trickle isn't very good if it's just a trickle, but trickle is pretty good if it's almost a flood. So the question is, how much trickle is there? And I'm saying that in any reasonable growth process, uh, you get a lot of trickling. So that's component number one. But, you know, almost nobody wanted to take credit for that because somehow trickle down had become a derogatory term. The second, which was a very important component of the UPA strategy, was that if you push for agriculture, then you'll get a lot of poverty reduction because by, the, by definition, that's a sector which, in, which employs a lot of people who are at the lower income levels. Uh, and secondly, uh, if you generate incomes in rural areas, it creates the kind of demand which creates market opportunities for other people who produce non-agricultural goods in the rural areas, I mean, take the simplest example is that if a, if a rural community becomes prosperous, uh, after a while, you know, beauty parlors uh, get set up in rural areas. So the service industry grows. Or if people buy scooters and motorcycles, then repair shops get set up. So there are a lot of linkages which actually keep the demand uh, in the rural areas. Now, some demand certainly leaks out to non-rural areas. But uh, an agriculture-led growth process has the maximum uh, spillover effect within rural areas, and that's good. The third, of course, and we were quite keen on that also, the third are programs that are directly uh, aimed at uh, the very poor. I mean, the best known, of course, is Magnarega, an employment program which um, creates demand for labor, strengthens the bargaining power of labor in rural areas, which is good. Uh, and then there are other programs like programs to increase productivity of small farmers, uh, programs that support uh, groups of women to uh, engage in uh, small economic activity, providing credit for self-help groups, et cetera, et cetera. So these are the three different components uh, which led to the increase in poverty. We know, I mean, the reduction in poverty. We know that there was a huge reduction in poverty. You know, interestingly enough, when we announced that, the results came out. I mean, uh, the, the opposition was amazing. I mean, you know, the opposition said there's a fraud on the people. 
uh, and a lot of uh, completely false statements, such as you've lowered the poverty line in order to show a fewer people. Actually, not true, because we'd raised the poverty line because we appointed a new committee. Uh, so anyway, that's, that's the politics of it. Uh, but I think that internationally, this was widely recognized. Uh, that poverty has gone down. And it was the, it's not just that it went down in percentage terms. That had been happening a little bit even earlier. It was the first time that the absolute number below the official poverty line actually went down. And I think that was a vindication of the fact that we have managed to generate inclusive growth, which was the objective all along. So, you know, the... The third natural thing to talk about here is the later years of the UPA, um, when there is a little bit of a downturn in terms of the growth. Um, there are certain fiscal and monetary policy decisions that you write about that you're not entirely sure about. But then, of course, that growth recovers and there's an uptick. I, in the interest of time, I'll leave um, that bit out and leave people to read it from your book and come straight to 2014. When the Modi government, when the NDA government comes to power, there is, uh, there is already an uptick. There's a recovery going on where growth is concerned. They come into power and they promise double digit growths. Now we all growth. Now we all know that's not quite panned out. We are not anywhere close to a double digit growth. To make matters worse, um, the GDP calculation, the way in which we calculate our GDP number, is altered and across the world there is some amount of concern about the validity of those numbers so we're not even entirely sure how bad the situation might actually be. Um, what are some of the initial mistakes that you think the government, NDA government, made so as not to be able to continue with the uptick in growth that came after the downturn during the UPA2 government? Well, you know, uh I think initially, quite frankly, uh, the government did not, uh, did not make any mistakes in the sense that uh, they, changed, uh, they changed the names of various schemes a little bit here and there, which is fine. But the bottom line that they were plugging was that we need faster growth, going to be private sector oriented growth, we want more foreign investment, and we want uh, domestic production to be fully competitive. That was the big and, you know, uh, uh, inclusive growth would change to uh, uh, Sapka, Saat, Sapka, Vikas, that kind of thing. It's changed, nothing wrong with that. Uh, initially, they were very critical of Magna Rega, but then they changed track on that also and recognized that Magna Rega is a good scheme and continued it. Then I think what happened, was, and, and of course, the uptick continued. So in the first couple of years, the economy did moderate. I personally think that the demonetization was a completely unnecessary shock. Uh, some people think that it, it, it pushed for, it led to a reduction in corruption, et cetera, et cetera. I don't think that that's really true. Uh, so I think the, demo, but the, the other thing about the demonetization was that it was a differential shock. I mean, it didn't shock the organized sector very much, but it really knocked the hell out of the informal sector. So from a distributional point of view, it weakened those parts of the economy which provide the maximum support for the poor. Uh, and even for even uh, in uh, agricultural areas, uh, marketing of agriculture, you know, uh, agricultural markets are almost entirely cash-based. So if you, if you create a huge shock to the cash economy, you have to consider what it would be doing uh, to the rest of the system. That was one, I think, mistake. Second was the, the way the GST got implemented. I personally think the GST was a good reform. As a matter of fact, the UPA uh, was pushing for it and failed to bring it about. So the government could legitimately have claimed that, you know, you fellows weren't able to do this. We've gone and got it done. Uh, although they were the ones who prevented the UPA from getting it done. But that, in politics, that's fair enough. But I think rather than rush it through with inadequate preparation. Uh, there should have been, having got the constitutional amendment done, there should have been more consultation on what kind of a GST do you really need. And, you know, I think there was a big problem that people didn't seem to realize that the real reason why the GST is such a good tax 
is because it's levied at a pretty uniform rate across the board. And somehow uh, in the discussions in the GST Council, uh, different state governments said, no, 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 how can this be? We must lower this rate, raise this rate. And you got into a complete mess. Uh, the frequency of those changes also made it very difficult for traders and uh, businessmen to follow what was happening. So the disruption that was caused by the GST, in my view, was unnecessary. Uh, and you can't quantify it, but I think that had a negative effect. Uh, I think those two were the principal factors that led to a bit of a slowdown uh, in, in, in the economy. Uh, and of course, more recently, I mean, I think a big problem that the uh, NDA government should have tackled, uh, and it's true that the problem may have arisen in the later years of the UPA, and that is the problem of non-performing assets. You know, I mentioned in the book that uh, it's a very natural phenomenon that when you get a boom, Everybody becomes over-optimistic. You know, uh, the, 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 in fact, I, I contributed to, to realism because when the 12th plan was being produced, uh, I said, look, we had originally thought it will be 9% growth. Because of the Eurozone crisis, it's not going to be 9% growth. We're going to lower it to 8%. And I was severely criticized uh, that what kind of a planning commission is this? We should be optimistic. We should you know, uh, uh, put forward targets that look good. Uh, so we brought it down to 8%. But the new government said double digit growth is around the corner. So, you know, I think what happens is when things are going well, uh, businessmen get over optimistic. They can also point to the government saying, look, government is saying there's going to be high growth. So we're only investing in anticipation of high growth. Banks get carried away and you get over lending. And then you get a problem and you're going to fix it. Now, I personally feel that uh, had the NDA recognized that, look, this is a problem and you've got to fix it, uh, we would not have the problem that we have today. I mean, the truth is that six years later, six years is a long time, six years later, we still have a banking system that is in a mess. And we also have a non-bank finance system, which is in a mess. Because what happened was that the, when the banks weren't lending, uh, it's the non-bank finance guys that started lending and the banks started lending to the non-bank finance guys. These guys lend to the smaller fellows. Uh, all these disruptions in the economy and lower growth made them go fat. And frankly, I think the first thing that they should have done is to come out with a strategy to fix the banking system. Now, Raghuram Rajan uh, in 2015, I think, asked for an asset quality review. Now, you know, you don't ask for an asset quality review uh, if you don't realize, if you don't recognize that, yes, there's a problem. So having recognized the problem, they should have started planning that what are we going to do if the asset quality review uh, suggests that there, there wasn't such a plan. Uh, and I mean, there still isn't such a plan. And for example, I don't regard, uh, they, did, they did recapitalize some banks, but what the government constantly said was that look, recapitalization without reforming the system is of no use. Is just kicking the can down the road. You'll have the same problem later. Nothing was done to reform the banks. Um, I don't believe that merging a weak bank with a strong bank is a reform. Uh, you just get a not so, not so good bank, an average kind of bank. So I think that this is going to be a real problem. And you know the fact that we've all been overtaken by the COVID pandemic, uh, and we're doing this at a time when the banking system is not sound, the current problems are like, uh, essentially short-term problems caused by the pandemic. But as and when this gets taken care of, maybe a year from now, uh, we're not in a good position to resume high growth because the financial system is still broke. So those but are, I, I think, to, major mistakes. Sorry to interrupt you, but I want to come because the, the pandemic is such a huge disruption that I want to talk about it slightly separately from you yeah. know, what was business as usual before March. Uh, in your book, you talk about um, these sort of shocks to the system, unnecessary shocks to the system, the GST, the badly implemented GST, demonetization, you talk about NPA. But even so, the good news is that you seem to be, at least when you were writing that book, fairly optimistic that we can still pivot to uh, a position, where a strong position to be able to continue on, uh, on, a, on the path that we should be going down. And you suggest a couple of, reforms for the short and medium term 
that the government should undertake in order to be able to carry out that pivot. Could you just go over, of course, you mentioned, uh, you know, the banking system and the non-banking finance system uh, reforming those, but could you go over some of the other reforms that you feel that the government should, that they're imminent and the government can mm -hmm. and should undertake them in order to be able to carry on? Where well, we left yeah, on? I'd be happy to do that. I mean, it's very clear that, you know, the fiscal situation had become quite difficult by the end of the uh, UPA, and it's continued to be difficult. There's been no improvement in it. There are questions about whether we are telling the full story on the fiscal deficit or not. Now, I made the point in the book that we should be very clear that we cannot, uh, we cannot continue with a fiscal deficit that's out of control. At the same time, I don't believe that the fiscal deficit can be solved by cutting down expenditure because there are many areas where we need to spend more. I mean, some of them are obvious like health, and we're seeing that the pandemic is revealing the inadequacies of that. Uh, we need to do much more on research, both for industry and agriculture. I mean, we're really falling behind uh, on that score. Uh, and I think the, in, order to, uh, uh, in order to be able to do that, and education, by the way, is the other area where we are really falling behind and we're not spending enough money we're also not getting value for the money we are spending, but for the money we are spending, is it's not adequate. Now, how do we get all this? And I mentioned at that time that, you know, even defense expenditure was quite low. Uh, the environment in our, in our neighborhood is not one that has been improving. So in all probability, we needed to jack up defense expenditure. How do you, how do, you do that? How do you increase this expenditure and at the same time reduce the fiscal deficit? I mean, the short answer is you need a much better performance on the tax front. Now there, there's a lot of research that has been done, which suggests that India does not mobilize as much tax revenue as it should be able to, given its development level. You know, many, many scholars have said that we probably should be getting at least five to six percentage points of GDP more uh, through taxation than we're doing. Now, I feel that we needed, we needed to introduce a, a major reform of our tax system because it doesn't generate revenues. And I don't mean by that we need to raise rates. I think we need to uh, reform the system, uh, reform the procedures in a manner that would encourage compliance. And there are many, I mean, these are expert things. I don't believe this can be done by simply asking the revenue department because the revenue department is running the existing system and they think they're doing a wonderful job. Uh, when the 1991 reforms uh, took place, one of the first things that Dr. Manmohan Singh did was to set up a high level expert committee headed by Raja Chellaya. Now Raja Chellaya was one of the most distinguished fiscal economists in the country. The committee included some of the top tax advisors in the corporate sector, others uh, economists who worked on this subject uh, accountants who deal with firms, and they came up with a tax strategy over the next five years. Okay, I think we need to do something like that. The biggest thing we need to do, clearly, is to recognize that the GST is not doing what we thought it would do. There are structural flaws in it. And I mean, the government has a big advantage because it has a majority. So, you know, if it, were to, if it were to use its majority to persuade people, the vested interests who oppose this kind of thing could be very easily brought under check. And, but it cannot be done by simply asking the revenue department, because actually they are the ones that are running the system. You need an independent view. So in my book, I think I'd said that we should have, we should set up a really, really high level committee which would also enable, uh, you know, uh, international guys to look at what are other countries doing. And India's taxes cannot be very different from taxes in other countries in a world which is getting increasingly interconnected. And that's very important that we should know that. Um, and it's not difficult. I mean, it could be done. I mean, for example, if they were to set it up now and say the next year's budget is going to reflect this, uh, you would have a report within six months of the top people. And, you know, wherever you go, uh, particularly foreign investors, uh, they complain that our tax system is non-transparent and gives too much discretion 
uh, to the tax authorities. I mean, let me give you my favorite example. Uh, we, this coming back to the, what's going to happen this year. I mean, it's quite clear that we are not going to have anything like the growth rate that was assumed when the budget was formulated. Maybe a fall of five to seven percent of GDP. Now, the first thing that should be done is recognize that tax revenues are going to be a lot lower. But you know, only a few weeks ago, I read in the newspapers. Now, I don't know whether this is correct or not, so I leave it to your readers to uh, viewers to check that the Revenue Department had informed all its tax officers that their tax collection targets are not being amended. Now, you know, if I'm a tax officer and I was given a target on the assumption that the GDP is going to grow at 7% in real terms, 10%, let's say, in nominal terms, and the GDP is going to fall by 5 or 6% in, in, in real terms and about the same maybe in nominal terms, and you tell me that I have to raise the same tax revenue, and what's going to happen is I'm going to make unreasonable assessments. I'm going to disallow expenses. I'm going to add in things, et cetera, et cetera. And you're going to have a lot of very dis uh, uh, unhappy taxpayers claiming that actions are arbitrary. To my mind, we should clearly acknowledge that, look, this is going to be a bad. It's not our fault. I mean, you know, COVID is hitting everybody. Uh, therefore, there, there'll be a big fall in tax revenue. If you talk to uh, most uh, uh, tax experts, they will tell you that the tax the decline in taxes is ratio to GDP would be between two and three percent of GDP. You know, we should build that into our into our revenue forecasting right now, so you don't have unreasonable unreasonable demands being made on investors. That's just one example. So I wanted to, um, you know, we can't not talk about where we are at this point in time now. Before COVID hit. We, um, as we've already said, growth was down, aggregate demand was down, rural wages were declining, investment was um, not quite uh, what it should have been. Um, and, you know, in, in the midst of this, we're hit by the pandemic, which makes the economic situation, which was already not quite favorable, even more dire. What do you make of the emergency fiscal and monetary responses that the government has come up with and the central bank has come up with in order to deal with the pandemic? And is there scope to do more? Have there been missteps? I would love to hear from you. Well, um, the numbers that are being put out uh, about the stimulus, and the term stimulus is used in a very loose way. Yeah. So normally you have a monetary stimulus, which is loosening the monetary side of the picture, and you have a fiscal stimulus, which is simply expenditure. Now, in a situation where, first thing you want to recognize is that in a situation where production has fallen because you've introduced a lockdown, uh, I don't think a stimulus by itself is going to increase production because there's a lockdown, okay? But on the other hand, for the poor, there's a huge drop in income. And to say that there's a, the, the, the government should do something to compensate that, you know, to the extent possible, they are doing something. Uh, but, you know, it's being done in a very uh, jerky manner. I mean, for example, uh, something was done for three months, then was extended for three months. That, you know, to my mind, if we had done a cleaner, cleaner action, recognizing right at the start that, look, this is going to be a bad situation, therefore we're doing this. Or if we had said, for example, that, look, we're introducing this for three months. And if it doesn't pick up within two months, we're going to extend it for another three months. It would create more of a sort of a sense of assurance uh, that you're going to get something. That's one point. But I think that within the 10% of GDP, which is being talked about, the actual fiscal stimulus is very small. It's only about 1%. Some people say a little less. Some people say a little more. It's only 1% of GDP. I think internationally, most other countries have done more of direct fiscal stimulus. You know, monetary stimulus doesn't necessarily uh, uh, have an effect because you just make money available to the banks. So they just put it in deposits in the Reserve Bank of India and don't lend. One of the reasons they're not lending is there's huge uncertainty on the fiscals, uh, on, the, on the, what the economy is going to do on the balance sheet of the firms and on their own balance sheets. I mean, had the banks been put into a much stronger position, then maybe the liquidity injection would have led to actual credit. That has not been done. 
So my view is that there isn't enough of a fiscal stimulus at all, and you need to do a lot more. Now, clearly, you need to spend more on health. I think they could have done more to help the states because, you know, the states have very little limited resources, and they're being badly hit by the loss of revenue. So what are, what's going to happen is they're going to get rid of, uh, they're not going to pay their, their staff, uh, their, uh, all the sort of uh, casual labor that is hired will be got rid of. And I don't think that you need that kind of hit right now. So I think there should have been more in that area. I want to pick up quickly on two things that you talked about. One is uh, public health. You know, successive governments have come and gone. And clearly the state of public health is of a, a big, big concern at this point in time when we're still grappling with the pandemic. If, God forbid, it picks up in the rural areas, it, we might find ourselves in a situation where there, there are loads of people who are sick with comorbidities and even primary and basic health care is not available. And yet India spends less than 1% of its GDP on public health. The infrastructure is abysmal. Why do you think that is? And what do you think can be done to, to, ta to, to kind of remedy this, this you know, age-long problem that we seem to be stuck with? Well, as you say, this has been a long-standing problem, I mean, for the last 20, 30 years. Um, you know, in, during the UPA, we had, in fact, pointed this out, at least from the Planning Commission side. And, you know, we said normally, normally 4% of GDP is what countries spend on health. Half of that should come from the public side and half of that comes from the private side, their own expenditure. In our case, uh, the public side is about 1% or a little more, a little less, 1%. And the private, the out-of-pocket expenses are much higher. I think this has been a major neglect for one important reason. You know, health is not a central subject. Health, primary health care is actually a state subject. So in the Planning Commission, we would keep lecturing state governments, and look, you ought to spend more on health, but they prefer to spend money on freebies. And the truth of the matter is that even when they spend on the when additional expenditure is done on health. It's done on tertiary care. It's not being done on primary health. And I think there's a, there's a breakdown in the sense that it's the most important thing for people's welfare, uh, but the democratic system seems to work in a manner where people don't demand it. I mean, look, in a democracy, if people demanded it, it would get done. There is just no demand for primary health. And I think this is where education is necessary. The state government, government has to take a lead. And I think biggest problem really is that uh, it is not a central government subject. So all the instrumentalities of state government, but different states may be doing a better job. And that's clearly the case. You know, some of the southern states are doing a very good job. The states, uh, Hindi speaking belt, doing a lousy job. Uh, and I think we need to know more about what is, uh, what is it that makes for a better public health approach. So two more questions from my end, and, and then I'll open it up to the audience. One is, again, picking up on something that you said earlier. Uh, you're very right about uh, what's going on with the states. The primary responsibility of dealing with the pandemic and its different fallouts is on the states. Their revenue has dried up. They are, uh, most of the states are um, owed massive GST dues. So um, they are all really, really stretched at this point in time. I want to ask you a slightly broader question in terms of post the planning commission. Do you think there's a void in terms of um, an institutional setup for negotiating center state, state relations, particularly when it comes to finances? And what do you think, what kind of shape should a new institution or a new mechanism take? Well, I don't know enough about what's happening in the government now. So I can't say that there's a void now which wasn't there earlier. But, you know, I certainly feel that uh, it doesn't matter whether you call it the Planning Commission or not. I mean, that, that's not at all important. Uh, it is a somewhat old-fashioned term. You know, even corporations have planning. I mean, planning is not a socialist concept only. There's a lot of planning that goes on in modern Western countries. Um, I think we do need a mechanism where people can be quite clear what are the national objectives and what is the capacity of the national government to deliver? Now, the one advantage of the planning process was that, you know, you got a five-year projection of everything and that was supposed to add up to something that's feasible. 
And of course, it tended to be a bit over optimistic, but then you made allowances. Today, we have no five year projection for anything. I mean, any ministry can say whatever it wants. And you cannot, you're not in a position to judge whether all these things are consistent with what the national uh, capability is. And of course, the states don't do it either because there's no more planning. So I think, I think whatever you call it, whether you call it planning, you call it something else, I'm not in favor of detailed planning. Everything doesn't have to be planned. But I think on basic things like education, health, how much do you need of defense expenditure? How much do you need in critical infrastructure areas? These are things where we need to have medium term plans, both for the center and for the state. Not, not this year's budget on a medium term perspective. And that medium term perspective should be reflected in the way we expect to distribute resources between the center and the state. Now, I mean, uh, I have no idea what the Niti Aayog does, whether they, I mean, I'm told that they do not have uh, any responsibility uh, for financial allocation, but I don't know whether they're doing studies that would essentially advise either the prime minister's office or the finance ministry that, look, this is how we should do it. And I don't know what the prime minister's economic advisory council does, but that's another institution which, you know, uh, given that there isn't the old planning commission, I mean, they could take on this role also. So there are, the, the role is very important. What you call it, what you call the institution that does it is in my view, not at all important. Okay, final question for me, sir. Uh, what are your thoughts on a sort of economic, what is being called an economic strike against China uh, in retaliation to a military strike, well, uh, uh, at least an alleged military st strike? And if you think that, that, that is there a precedent of, of any such thing that you can think about, could it be effective? And if yes, is the banning of apps that has been the most ostensible face of this economic strike enough? I mean, are we, I guess what I'm asking is, are we in a position to be able to divorce our economic interests from those of China's entirely at this point in time? You know, this is a very, it's a very difficult, uh, I need to be better informed before I uh, take a position. Uh, in any country, if you, if, you, uh, if you run into a difficulty with another country, uh, it invariably affects your economic relations. I have no idea uh, how, how much difficulty we are facing on the border issue, because I don't have any authentic statement of whether that is easing off or not easing off, etc. I would say that, you know, uh, around the world, uh, the... the the, the need to bring all these kind of digital activities under a new kind of regulation, I mean, is all over there. I think we need to know what's happening around the world. You know, more generally, uh, the, China is going to be the largest economy in the world uh, very soon. So it doesn't make sense for us to say that we are going to delink ourselves from the largest economy in the world. Uh, if we wanted to do that, then all the more reason we should be integrating with other economies in the world. But we don't seem to be doing that either. Because, you know, the uh, regional uh, uh, economic partnership, a comprehensive economic partnership agreement with the ASEAN countries, we were supposed to sign that. It was a way of integrating with this larger region. We refused to sign that. So what does that mean? I mean, if, we are, if we're not going to have relations with China, and by the way, uh, I don't think there's been a clear statement by the government uh, on what, uh, what it intends to do regarding economic relations with China. There is a statement that investments from China will require special approval. And I think to the extent to which there are security concerns, uh, that, is not, that would not necessarily worry me. Though it would be a good idea to declare what are, what are the security sensitive areas and what are not sensitive areas. I mean, that makes a lot of sense. Uh, so I'm not answering your question uh, very clearly, uh, simply because I don't know what the intention is. But the only thing I would say is that, you know, the only way we can de-link ourselves from China, if for some reason, national security, etc., cetera, uh, it became necessary to do so, is if we integrate strongly with everybody else. 
China, by the way, is integrating strongly with everybody else. So uh, we are one fifth the size of China in terms of GDP. So if you have a China which is integrating with everybody else, and you have an India which is one fifth the size and not integrating with everybody else, you're just going to lose the economic race. That's for sure. And this is a big issue which is uh, which has come up. Uh, it's not clear what the new mantra or self-reliance means, because you know when the prime minister talked about it, he said. We must become part of the global supply chain. That's wonderful. I mean, if, if, we are, if our definition of self-reliance is that we must be there and demonstrate that we are a capable bunch and be part of the global supply chain, that's excellent. But there are other people saying that, no, what it means is we must raise protective barriers and not integrate. Now, if you're raising protective barriers against China because you feel that China is taking advantage of you, that has an element of bargaining in the sense that if they stop doing that, then you will change your policy. But if along with that, you're dealing with everybody else, then to my mind, that is a highly dubious, uh, uh, highly dubious policy. And I think this is a, a big question, uh, which is not yet not clear to me what the government intends. And I think we need greater clarity. Uh, are we anti importing everything from anywhere? Uh, and how is that going to be consistent with being part of the global supply chain? I mean, being part of the global supply chain means allowing imports from somewhere, adding some value to them and re-exporting them. So if you adopt anti-import policies, that rules out being part of the global supply chain. And nobody will invest in India if we cannot be part of their global strategy. I mean... So I think, I think there's a huge question mark, and I'm not, sure, uh, I'm not sure what government policy is. But these are early days. So what I would want is much greater discussion and clarity. And I hope that Indian business, which, is under, which understands all this, is engaged with the government to indicate to them what they would like. You know, this was when we opened up in 1991. Uh, everybody wanted their inputs to be freely importable and no import of whatever they produce. So this is a normal, this is a normal business strategy. But it's not, a, it's not an internally consistent one. So government has to recognize this. Well, here's hoping there'll be more clarity. There are loads of questions. I don't know how many I'll be able to take, but I will start straight away so that um, we can get as many in as possible. Um, Okay, so Priya Alex asks, is, uh, that's been answered already. Um, please bear with me while I read this. I can't see any question appearing. I, I, will, I will read them out to you, sir. No worries. So the first one is by Rajan Saxena, who says, I find it intriguing that there are rightfully many stories around the reforms of 1991 and the country escaping from the economic pool. But there's hardly any analysis on the reasons why we got into such an economic mess in the first place. Uh, what do you think led us there? Well, I think uh, what I think led us there was... Uh, prolonged continuation of an excessively controlled economy, which was simply not consistent with producing an efficient economy. And in the short run, there was an expansion of expenditure by the government in the last few years of the 1980s. An expansion of expenditure always leads to some kind of balance of payments crisis. That became very severe in 1990 uh, because you had at the same time the Gulf War and the uh, price of oil shot up. Uh, and basically, the Indian economy did not seem to be uh, as flexible as other economies at the time. Uh, and I think that's what the 1991 reforms did. It gave a clear signal that, look, we're not continuing with this old, uh, inherited, excessively controlled economies. We're getting rid of all that. Ashish Kale asks, um, he essentially wants to know um, what your suggestions are for reforms to get us out of the mess that we seem to be in, in, in terms of the economy at this point. That is something that you did touch upon. I did ask you this question. He says, you mentioned tax and GST, but what else can be done? So he just wants to know if there's something you'd like to add to that. 
Well, I think, uh, look, um, in my, my personal view is that the tax issue is extremely important because we're talking about hopefully over the next three or four years generating another four to five percent of GDP through taxes. So it's a very major reform. It needs to have the best expertise and it needs conversations between government and industry and the public so that people understand why it's necessary. That's point number one. Point number two is I think we've got to fix the financial system. We are, we are not addressing some of the basic reasons why our public sector banking does not lead to efficient banking. Now, this has been on the table. I mean, there's some people who say we should not rely on public sector banks. That's highly controversial. Others say that look, if you want to rely on public sector banks, don't have a system where the finance ministry has direct control of every bank by having its people on the board. This is the PJ Nayak committee, which just set up a, a, a holding company with, uh, run by top level bankers, which would be appointed by the government. But they would be the ones who would then appoint senior positions in the public sector banks, not the government. At the moment, the, the all senior positions in public sector banks are made by the cabinet. And that politicizes them, whatever the government. I mean, this is a criticism of all government. So that's a big issue that we need to address. I think it's also true that the whole issue of are we going to continue to be open and how open is a very important one, particularly because globally, the, you know, there's a, a backing off from globalization. Now, let me say the reason why there's a backing off from globalization is that once developing countries started opening up and strengthening themselves, the developed countries found that they lost competitiveness. So they are closing down because they've been losing out on the globalization scale. We have been gaining on the globalization scale. I think it would be absurd for us to back down. We should actually be saying, look, we need to build a, 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 an economy that's more open. We should be allying ourselves with those countries that are willing to be open. I think the ASEAN countries are a good example. And by and large, Asia is the area where high growth is likely to continue. So we need to be open. We need to sort of... Uh, indicate that we're willing to integrate with this part of the world. There's a serious danger, in my view, of a re return to protectionism on the grounds that everybody else is doing. It's true that that's what the Americans are doing. But they're doing it because they're losing out. They're losing out because we are becoming more competitive. I'm mean, quite absurd if we were to start doing the same thing. Pradeep Swaroop wants to know, do you think giving rupees 72,000 every year to the poor would have helped economic growth? I guess another way to rephrase this question or phrase this question is what are your views on universal basic income of any shape or form? Well, look, uh, my view is that certainly government policy needs to focus on what it can do for the poor. Whether that is to be done by targeting certain groups and delivering essential support to them or introducing a universal basic need, that I think is a very open question. Almost no country has done it. So, you know, generally uh, one should learn from what other countries are doing. Uh, I also feel that um, those who say that we can, we can introduce a basic, uh, human, uh, basic uh, income, universal basic income, usually point to abolishing a whole lot of subsidies. And that if you could abolish those subsidies, we could convert that into a universal basic income. But, you know, politically, your ability to abolish those subsidies is extremely limited. So I think those who want to push for a universal basic income should launch a movement calling for an abolition of subsidies and then promising a basic universal income. What will happen is that the subsidies will all stay and the universal basic income will come in. And we'll do much less of investment and much less of uh, productive of, of expenditure on things that support the productive process. As a general rule, uh, I am not convinced that uh, this is the time for us to be pushing for a universal basic income. On the other hand, I am in favor of picking up a whole lot of strategic interventions where we can do uh, a lot. So there, I mean, Typically, we would close about now, but there are a lot more questions. Perhaps my timekeeping wasn't very good. I asked you more than my fair share. Would you be okay to carry on for another 10 and, and answer some of these questions entirely? Yeah, sure. Go ahead. 
Thank you. So Kanan Santanam asks, to what extent would you say that the fiscal stimulus is limited to 1% or so because of possibility of downgrade by international rating agencies? I guess the larger question here is that where does the money come from for fiscal stimulus and should we be worrying about fiscal deficit at this point? No, this is a very, this is a very fair and good question because I don't want to <clears throat> create the impression that you can do whatever you like. I think the rating agencies are quite intelligent. They, if India were to say that, look, boys, uh, yes, we have a fiscal deficit that's a bit too high. Yes, we have a debt to GDP ratio that's a bit high. But remember, our debt to GDP ratio is not that high compared to many other countries. I mean, Japan has a debt to GDP ratio of almost 200%. And, you know, the key thing, the two things you have to worry about. One, is if you widen the fiscal deficit, you crowd out private investment because the government takes resources which otherwise would go into private investment. That is not relevant today. Nobody in the private sector is investing. Second is that when you widen the fiscal deficit, you raise the debt to GDP ratio. But you can reassure people that, look, this is a one-off temporary thing and we will introduce a slew of measures that will bring the deficit down as a ratio to GDP over time. And that would happen if you are raising more taxes because of tax reform, and you're doing all kinds of other reforms that will jack up the growth rate. Now, if you don't do that, if you don't have a reform, you don't jack up the growth rate, you just raise the fiscal deficit, certainly you'll go broke. But it's the package that has to be sold. I have no doubt whatsoever that if the government were to articulate this case, that this year we are, we are going to have a uh, six to seven percent decline in GDP. Now the point is it has to first acknowledge that. It hasn't acknowledged it yet. Uh, if you have a six to seven percent decline in GDP, your fiscal deficit is going to be much more than 3.5 percent anyway. I mean you'll probably go without any problems, you'll go up to about six percent or even higher than six percent. Then the question is that look, uh, that's going to happen because taxes disappear. All right. In addition to that, there are a hell of a lot of people particularly the poor, who will actually lose their incomes, maybe for two months, maybe for three months, maybe for six months, we don't know. So you say, look, we're going to provide support for them in order to keep them going. And don't worry about the fiscal deficit because we've set up this group that's going to give us major tax reform and we're going to use our majority in parliament to get this tax reform done. I think people will respect that. Great. The next question is, do you believe that the approach of government uh, towards resolution of ILNFS, Yes Bank and PMC Bank has been in the right direction or did it need to be any different? If so, how different? I haven't actually, I haven't looked at, I haven't looked at the, these case, individual cases because I don't know enough about them. But I, I mean, as far as the ILF, uh, ILFS uh, case is concerned, I mean, I have a lot of confidence in uh, Uday Kotak, who I think is running that rescue operation, and I'm sure you'll get a good outcome uh, out of it. There is a question uh, in particular about the manufacturing industry from Amit Shah. Um, I'm assuming that's not our Home Minister. Uh, how can the manufacturing industry come out in, pres in the present scenario of the low demand sales, manpower shortage, uh, the capital having dried up in the last three months, um, and of course, paying statutory expenses. Do you have any uh, recommendations in particular for the manufacturing sector? Well, that's a very big sector. And, you know, I mean, it, it encompasses a huge range. But clearly, you know, the, uh, the lockdown effect as it opens up, and we don't know, for example, whether when it opens up, bits of it may not get reintroduced. So there's a lot of uncertainty. But let's face it, uh, we just don't know. We haven't yet seen a significant turnaround. But I think you can assume that however bad it is this year, it's going to start improving next year. The uncertainty is how bad is it going to be this year? And I have no way uh, of knowing. You know, the economy will recover. The important thing to note is that if it falls by, let's say, 6% this year, and then rises by 7% next year, then what it means is in 21-22, GDP will be back to where it was in 2019-20. The question is, when will industry feel that things are now got back to normal and then start investing again? That's one point. The second is what's going to happen to exports. And there again, there's huge uncertainty. 
So, and, and the IMF makes that play, but, you know, nobody really knows how the world is going to move. So manufacturing has to live with some uncertainty, but one can assume that six months down the road, it will become much clearer uh, the pace at which recovery is taking place. There are two particular questions about politics and economics that I am going to try and take together. One is by Raghuram Ramanathan, who asks, you have, been, uh, you have pointed out um, how politics influences economic policy. Can economics be depoliticized or non-political? I guess this is one of the biggest questions econ economists have been grappling with forever and ever, but your thoughts would be welcome. But sir, before you answer that, um, there is a second part to this question. Um, by another listener who says there's been a huge furore uh, about the MOU between the Congress and China. Times of crisis is in the role of the principal opposition party to rally with the government in a united manner. The point of this question is, what is your take about the divided political ecosystem of today, particularly with respect to China or I guess on the whole? That's about six or seven questions rolled into one. No, let, me, let me say one. I think the idea that economics can be d divorced from politics in a democracy is simply not credible. Uh, and I think that's where uh, how sophisticated the democracy is, how sophisticated the politicians are, how they can manage to be competing in politics while at the same time creating uh, a basis for consensual action to keep the country sound. I mean, these are the things that determine how healthy a country is. Uh, there's, no, there's no guarantee uh, that this will work in a healthy way. It could easily work in a negative manner. You know, as far as individual issues of, uh, I'm not privy to what the Congress party did or uh, so I have no idea uh, on those, those issues, I don't think I should be commenting on because I just don't know about them. I agree, sir, that I don't think that's relevant to this discussion, but I will press you to answer one question, which is how the sort of uh, extreme polarization that we're witnessing when it comes to politics in India, as well as in the US and many other places, does this make the scenario worse for implementing sound economic policy um, and getting around politics? No, absolutely. There's no question about it. Look, I mean, uh, in a democratic environment, uh, the, the, the only way you can create an environment in which sensible economic policy is conducted is if all the participants are actually aware that there's a broad consensus which they should accept as the basis for policy uh, and then move forward on that basis while at the same time competing fiercely in political terms. As long as you're aiming at something in the middle and judging yourself by what the middle thinks, you're probably in, on reasonably good ground. The moment you position yourself on either extreme, I mean, you're going to create an act, a highly divisive system, which will simply lead to, and, and I mean, social media and all the rest will multiply this thing. So, I, I mean, this is a real challenge, not just in India, but around the world, that we are in an environment in which extreme polarization uh, can prevent sensible decisions from being taken. Absolutely. Final question. Uh, it's by Shabani Sethi, I think, who is asking on behalf of Neera Bhatia. Uh, tips for small to medium-sized businesses to survive the nosedive due to Corona. Anything to the MSME sector, to the government or the, uh, the business side of things? Any, any thoughts, any recommendations? No, I think there's, there's no question that they're the ones that are worst hit. Uh, and, you know, in many ways, the, the bank, the, the, what you call the liquidity injection into the banks, won't necessarily help the MSMEs because a very small proportion of the MSMEs get their credit from the banks. Most of them get their credit either from their own different sources, informal sector, money lenders, non-bank finance companies. So I think you're going to have a big shakeout in the MSMEs. Uh, the government needs to be watchful. They need to do whatever they can to help them. Uh, and they need to encourage the banks to sort of go out of their way to provide credit to this sector. You know, one advantage of having a public sector banking system is that the public sector banking system can be used to actually direct credit a little more uh, generously uh, towards, uh, towards MSMEs. Now, just remember, solvent. 
So you give them some money, uh, it's not clear that they'll necessarily survive. Maybe somebody else will expand and take their space. They are vulnerable and they need special support. There's no question about that. You know, particularly in our case, because they're a very large part of total employment. I mean, uh, that's the thing. Well, I have to break off at this point, unfortunately. Thank you so much, sir. And um, apologies for going on and on. It was fabulous to listen to you. And thank you for being so patient with us. Let me, let me do a little advertisement for my book. I hope that you, in case you weren't satisfied with what I said, I suggest that you go and read this book. Those of your readers who haven't read it, I urge you to read it. I second that. I can't recommend it enough. It is absolutely fabulous. And it's so easy to read. And it is, it's just full of insights that you will think about for days to come. Thank you. Sir. Thank you. Thanks a lot.